seminar and today we are very happy to have Maria Caro from Universidad de Complutense de Madrid and she will talk about restricted weak type estimates for averaging operators. Um, Maria, okay. Okay. Stop. Okay, thank you very much uh, Rames for the invitation to to give this uh, seminar. And uh, well, uh, I'm going to start with a absolutely very basic introduction. Uh, you will see. It is just uh, I gave this uh, talk a couple of months ago for a bigger audience, and they told me just to start very, very, very simple, and, uh, and, um, and then I did it. And I think that it is always nice that, that at least the five minutes, everybody, absolutely everybody, even students which are not analysts can understand. So I'm going to do it in the same way. So uh, assume that X is a Banach space and uh, we have um, some uh, sequence of elements in X. Then of course, the norm of the sum is less or equal than the sum of the norm. If the sum is finite, this is clear because of the, this is a norm. And if it is not uh, finite, then we have to use completeness. Now, what can we say if X is not Banach? And, uh, and the answer in general is that we can say nothing, right? So what happened if we, instead of having just a sum, we just uh, consider this uh, function big F, which is just the integral of F X minus Y times G of Y. And the function G is in L1. So as you know, this is just the convolution of two functions. Then, uh, well, by Minkowski integral inequality, we know that uh, the norm of big F in the space X is less or equal than the norm of the function F uh, translated and that times the absolute value of uh, G of Y. Now, if the space X is invariant under translation, it means that that norm, that that norm here does not depend on Y, then of course this is less or equal than the norm of f in x times the norm in l1 of the function g okay now we can ask the same question as before and what can we say if x is not banach and the answer again is we can say nothing in general now let us go and pass uh, to the setting of a uh, operator so the situation now is that we are going to have uh, what happened? Uh, okay, we, we are going to have a, a sequence of operators TJ that go from some space Y into X, and we are going to assume that uh, that family of operator is uniformly bounded for every J. Then we construct this operator, which is going to be an average operator, because I'm going to assume that the sum of the coefficients is equal to one. And of course, if the space is Banach, if that space is Banach, we can say we know that the norm of the operator is bounded by the L1 norm, little L1 norm of the sequence C. But if X is not Banach, then what can we say about the boundedness of the operator? And again, in general, we can say nothing because there are examples where the answer is affirmative. There are examples where the answer is negative. And there are examples which are the most interesting cases where the answer is open. So what is going to be our favorite Banach space is going to be the space LT, the Lebesgue spaces, and our favorite non banach space is going to be the weak type space L1, okay, which is defined in, the, in this way. Okay, so this is a, why, uh, okay, so there are many operators in harmonic analysis where we know that the operator satisfied that they are bounded from LP into LP, but they are not bounded from L1 into L1. However, they are weak type one one, right? Because the space weak L1 is bigger than L1. So we would like to address the question, when is it true that the averaging operator is weak type one one? Okay, so this is the abstract. This is the, the end of the basic introduction, very basic as you have seen. 
And this is the abstract that I sent to you, right? So there are many operators in harmonic analysis, which can be described as an average of a family of operators dj for which some boundedness properties are known. In particular, if dj are uniformly bounded on LP, then Minkowski integral inequality tells us that t also satisfies this property. But things change completely if the information that we have is that those operators are of weak type 1. -1. However, under certain conditions of the operator TJ, the weak type boundedness can be rich. And this is going to be the goal of this talk. Tell you what are those conditions on the operator TJ so that we can assure the weak type boundedness of the averaging operator. And this is a joint work with my student, uh, my latest student, Seth Divina, who is going to defend his thesis in a couple of months. Okay, so this is the end uh, in the basic introduction. And now, now I'm going to give you an introduction for analysts, which is based uh, in this kind of, of, of sentences that we say, right? There are many operators in harmonic analysis, so blah, blah, blah. So what, uh, what are those operators? So there are many, but I'm going to give uh, the motivation problem that I like very much, which is the so-called the Deleu restriction theorem. So, First of all, let us recall what is a Fourier multiplier. So we have, we say that uh, a function f is a Fourier multiplier if the following operator tm is bounded on LP. So we have a function, we compute the Fourier transform of the function, we multiply by the multiplier by the function m, and then we, we compute the uh, inverse of the Fourier transform. And we say we also have a definition of multiplier on LP of the group of the torus, right? In this case, it is, since the dual group, if the integer, the uh, Fourier multiplier is going to be a sequence, okay? So a sequence in the integer is going to be a Fourier multiplier on LP if that operator that I have defined here is bounded on LP of the torus. So this operator is nothing, but uh, we just multiply the Fourier coefficients of the function g, uh, g by m of n. Okay, so the, this theorem of, of current de Liu says the following. If m is a continuous function on R, so I am here now. So if m is a continuous function on R, which is a multiplier, then the restriction to the integers is a multiplier on LP of the torus. Of course, it is important the condition that M has to be continuous because, uh, well, the integers has measure zero and uh, we need to, to, to have the very well defined the functions on the integer. However, this uh, theorem was extended to the case where the function may not be continuous but satisfies a condition that is called regulated. Regulated means essentially that every point is a Lebesgue point. Okay, so but here is the definition, some definition. So we take a function phi, which is an approximation of the identity. And then we assume that the limit when we made the convolution of phi t with m is equal to m of x for every x. So since this is very well defined at every point, it makes sense to consider m restricted to a set of measure zero. And the theorem says that it is enough to have that the function is regulated. Okay, and uh, well, uh, I learned this result uh, from this paper of uh, Koifman uh, and Guido Weiss in 76, but in fact, there was some information before that paper that that result was true. Okay, how to go from continuous to regulated? Okay, I think that the idea is very simple and it goes as follows. So we have a, a, a function that it is, we are going to assume that it is a multiplier. Uh, by the way, um, I cannot see anything. I just see my, my, <laughs> my computer and my transparency. Uh, so please, if some of you have some question, stop me. If I, if I do, if I say something that you, if I go too fast or, or, or I, have, I, I say something that you don't know the definition, please stop me and ask, okay? Um, so, 
We have a multiplier. We know that multiplier are bounded function. So what we do is we just take a function in L1 that is the grade one, and we construct the, uh, well, the function phi t is here, and we construct the operator associated with the convolution of phi t with m, okay? Now, the question that we ask here is that if it is true that this new operator is bounded on LP uniformly in T, that is, is this a Fourier multiplier uniformly in T? Okay, and the point is that if the answer to that question is positive, then we can proceed as follows. We have the information that that operator is bounded on LP, then if that, if that is also true, we can, uh, what, uh, what we can do is just apply the classical theorem because this function here is the convolution of an L infinity function with an L1, so it is continuous. So we can apply the classical delu result for continuous function and to conclude that this is, uh, that this is also true, this is true. Okay, and, uh, and once we are here, the next step is just making, uh, just take the limit when t goes to zero and that's it, okay? So as soon as we solve that question, we can pass from continuous to regulated in a very easy way. So this is the question. If a function is a, a multiplier, is it true that the convolution is a multiplier? Okay, now the answer to this question is also very easy. Because if we write and compute what is the, multi, the operator associated to the convolution, the simple computations shows that it has that expression here. Okay. Now the point is that this operator that it is here in brackets, this operator here, the Fourier, the inverse Fourier transfer of that operator, is clearly bounded from LP uniformly, because uh, the translation of a multiplier is of course a multiplier. So our operator is an averaging because that function integrates one. So that operator is an averaging of operator which are uniformly bounded. So the result follows by Minkowski integral inequality. Now, this, uh, this uh, theorem has very nice applications. So let me just give you some. Assumed that, well, this is true, of course. We have here the Hilbert transform. So the Hilbert transform is the multiplier, but it is simply the sign. And we know that the Hilbert transform is bounded from LP into LP. Now, the function sign is regulated. It's not continuous, but it is regulated. So by that result, what we can conclude is that that operator here that assign one to the, Fourier coefficient with n positive and minus one with the Fourier coefficient with n negative, which is the conjugate operator on the torus is also bounded. Uh, a second application, we can make a combination of the Fourier transfer with identity. And of course, this is bounded. So we have that the projection of functions in LP in the analytic part of the Fourier series is also bounded on LP. Or for example, if we consider an interval in, in R, then this, is a, this, this, uh, this multiplier is essentially, well, it's a combination of Hilbert transfer. So and again, is a, is a, um, is boundedness, this operator is bounded from LP into LP. And therefore the partial sums of the Fourier series are uniformly bounded on LP. Okay, so these are some application of that uh, very nice result. Okay, so coming back to the original problem that we wanted to solve, let me say for later purposes, what is, what is this saying us in the kernel side? Okay. So every multiplier, we know that we have here a, a Fourier multiplier in the, in, the, in the kernel side is just a convolution. And, uh, and the associate operator is nothing but to perturbate the kernel by a nice function, okay? So what we are saying is that if we have a, a kernel and the convolution operator is bounded on LP, we can really perturbate the function in, in a nice way and we still have a bounding operator. 
Now, what happens if instead of working on LP, we work on a weak LP? Okay, in this case, uh, well, everything can be done in the same way, except that, okay, so we can write down, it is also an average, but of course, we cannot conclude the result because we don't have Minkowski integral inequality, okay? So, well, this question was open for a while till uh, in 1994, Asmar, Berson, and Burgain uh, solved the problem in this uh, paper in the positive way. Okay, so if we have a multiplier, then the convolution is also, um, is also multiplied. I have to say that the, in this paper, they were interested, oh my goodness, I don't know. I don't know what 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 the, the page. Hold on, it was thirty three. A little bit. Um, okay, I, I was here. Okay, so so I have to say that they were interested in this in in solving the problem of the restriction. So the the Liu theorem for which Taiwan won. And, uh, and the technical part of this paper is precisely uh, that result, okay? Now, um, let me tell you a, a little of history of, of this problem because uh, in that paper that I have mentioned of Asmar versus Burgain, they were studying not in fact just a convolution operator, but they were working with maximal operators associated to a family of multipliers. Then, in a, in a, one year later, in 95, in Asmar version with the Gillespie, they extended uh, this kind of result to the case of continuous multipliers in locally compact abelian group. And uh, in 97, my student, uh, my former student, Jose Antonio Raposo, he extended the result uh, from continuous to regulated, okay, to the case of regulated. And in 2009, Andersen and Mohanty, they extend uh, Karel de Lioux, uh, not uh, in the context of weighted LP spaces, okay, that we go, they are going to appear later. And they did it for P bigger than one. In 2012, um, uh, in a joint work with my former student, Salvador Rodriguez Lopez, uh, we solved the problem for in the weighted case fat for p equals one. And there has been other papers that uh, I would like to mention uh, these three here, which uh, they have extended the results uh, in the multilinear setting for, for multilinear operator and restriction of multilinear operator. So it is this paper of uh, Fan and Sato and also of my, of my student Salvador. And then uh, also in 2015, Salvador did uh, some results in, in the multilinear and weighted setting. Okay. And there has been more paper later on, but these are, in my opinion, the more important one. Okay, so the, this operator, uh, the common fact of those uh, papers is that the operator involved, involved are of convolution type. Okay. So, I want to, to address a general question, and it is the following. Assume that we have a family of operators, and we know that it is with Taiwan 1 uniformly, and we have some probability measure space, let's say differential of P, and we construct uh, some averaging operator, and we want, to know, we want to have, we want to know when we can assure that the operator TA is um, with Taiwan 1. Of course, the answer uh, in general is completely false, right? This is a contraexample that it is even infinity, right? So we just take the function f, we integrate for zero one, for example, and we define that simple operator. They are all uh, with Taiwan one, with constant one, but the averaging operator is infinity. Okay, so we really need some, some, some extra conditions on the operator. Okay, so I'm going to give you other contests uh, which, uh, which, are motiv which were a motivation problem for me, where this situation appeared. The first one is in the setting of uh, bounded variation functions. Okay, so assume that we have a bounded variation function. I'm going to normalize so that uh, at the minus infinity is equal to zero. 
And uh, then we know that M of, M, M of C is equal to the integral of uh, a measure, which is a finite measure. And uh, hence, if we write down what it is, the Fourier multiplier associated to that, this is nothing but the integral, this is a, it's a computation of that finite measure times what? Times the operator, which is nothing by the Fourier multiplier of an interval, which as we said before, is essentially a Hilbert transform. So every uh, bounded uh, variation multiplier is an average can be written in this way. So the question is, is if M is a bounded variation function, it is a weak type one one. Now, uh, assume now that we have an integral, another example, assume now that we have an uh, integral operator, but at this, it is not of convolution type. It could be just a singular integral or something like that. So it is a function with a kernel, it's an operator which is defined with a kernel, um, satisfy whatever. And then we want to study some modification of the kernel, either in this way, or maybe we can also consider that kind of uh, modifications, okay? Probably this is more natural, but anyhow. So the question is that if we know that the operator is with type one one, is it true that when we perturb the kernel, as it happened in the convolution case, we also have with type one one? So in this case, uh, well, we can also write down the, the, this new operator and we see that it is also an average operator because uh, this function is going to be very good. And here we have some modification of the original operator, which is nothing that, uh, well, this is uh, something which has modulus one. So those operators are going to be uniformly bound. And the, the third case is the case of uh, radial Fourier multipliers. So assume that we have a function which is radial, and we are interested in, in, in consider a, a Fourier multiplier of this form under the conditions. So we need some decay conditions. So we need that some derivative, which might be fractional derivative or not. So some derivative uh, times some power function is, is um, uh, integrable. Then, uh, well, some computation tell us that this, this multiplier can be written as an average because this is a function in L1. Well, some constant here if it, if, if it is not one, but that's not important. And here, what appear is the bogner ries operator at the critical index, okay? And it is known that those operators at the critical index are with type one one. This was a very nice result of, of Michael Chris. Okay, so, well, I think that we have uh, enough examples that say that many interesting operators appearing in the, in, as an averaging operator. But in all the examples that I have given to you, what it happens is that in part, uh, we have some extra, some strong condition on those operators, which are going to be that those operators are with type one one for every u in a one. Okay, so uh, well, uh, we want to um, ask. So we ask the following question: If our operators are uniformly bounded for every weight in the Mackenhaut class a one. Is it true that the average operator is with type one one? Okay, so this is the main question of this talk that I am going to, 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 to solve, okay? So let me, so we have to start by saying something about weighted theory, just in, in case some of you don't know what it is a one. I am going to, 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 to make some, some recall and something where well, I'm going to tell you the basic thing of this theory. So first of all, uh, we have the hard, the hard little maximal operator, which is the most important operator in harmonic analysis, I would say, okay, appears everywhere, which is defined as the supremum over all cubes containing X of the average uh, of the function over the, over the cube. And uh, this Mackenhaut ways, I have given you here the definition, 
but we are, it, it, this is not going to be important, okay? So there is some definition of this weights AP, which is just uh, that condition here. And this A1 that I have mentioned before are essentially those functions so that the maximal operator is equivalent to the function, right? Because uh, we all know that this is always bigger than the function f. So the condition that we have here is that the function is equivalent to the, to the, to the weight, okay? And this uh, thing here, I call it the norm. It is not a norm, okay? But, but, but it's written in this way. This, this quantity is going to appear in a moment. Okay, so these weights appear in 72 when Mackenhoff proved that they are the right, the weights, that characterizes completely the boundedness of the hardy littlewood maximal operator. So if P is bigger than one, uh, the hardy littlewood maximal operator is bounded on LP if and only if omega is in AP. But this is, a, this is not true for P equals one, but for P equals one, we can say the same, but as soon as we've changed the strong condition by the weight type condition, okay? So in particular, those ways in A1 are those that characterize the weak type 1, 1 of the hard deleted wood maximal operator. Okay, so the theorem that is going to be fundamental for what I am going to, to tell you is the, the, the so-called Rubio de Francia uh, theorem, which I don't know if you are familiar with. Some, some of you for sure that are very much familiar with, uh, with this theorem. But uh, in general, analyst people may not be so familiar with that, uh, with this theorem, at least people in functional analysis or complex analysis. But here in Spain, this theorem is, is, is well known for everybody because Rubio de Francia, Jose Luis Rubio de Francia, uh, was a very, uh, uh, how to say, love uh, colleague of us okay, who passed away very young and, and uh, well. There are, we have uh, some Rubio de Francia prize. I mean, for us, Rubio de Francia was uh, a very special, a, a very special person. And then this theorem is very well known in, in, in our community, right? But, um, okay, so let me tell you what this theorem says. There is a lot uh, of better result than the one that I'm going to mention, but this is the one that I'm going to use in a moment, okay? So imagine that we have an operator and we know exactly that information, that the operator is bounded with type one one, and we know that for every weight in A1. So this is precisely the hypothesis that I am assuming in, in, our, in our operators, right? Okay, so that information implies that for every P and for every omega in AP, we also have the boundedness on LP. Okay, so this is, one of the theorems of Jose Luis Rubio. Okay, so let me try to solve the problem with this, with the following technique, the, the problem that we want to address. So, okay, so this is our hypothesis. We have a family of operators which are uniformly bounded. Okay, they are weak type with constant uniformity. Then by Rubio de Francia, we can go up and we have some family which are bounded with constant uniformly on LP for, for every P and every omega in AP. Now, since LP is Banach, we know that the average operator is bounded from LP into LP. And since this happened for every P, we would like to go down, but the, the problem here in Rubio de Francia extrapolation theorem is that this is false, okay? So with Rubio de Francia extrapolation theorem, we can go up, but uh, we have, if we have that hypothesis, does not imply the hypothesis that we are looking for. Um, to see that this is true, just think, for example, in the, in the composition of two maximal operators, right? This is true, trivially but this is false, okay? So it is, it, this is false. Okay, I say, unfortunately, because if this were true, then uh, we, we would have so solved our result. But let me say that it is, or fortunately, because this is a, where we have a, 
improve the theory. Okay, so, ah, okay, this, okay. Um, okay, so let me say why I say fortunately. If we try to, re, to that this uh, arrow becomes positive, what we need is to assume the hypothesis for a bigger class of AP, okay? Now the point, the, the point here is that if we make here a bigger class, for example, the maximal operator will not be bounded because the maximal operator is bounded on LP0 of omega. If, ah, sorry, this, is, this would be, this would be, this would be P, not P0, okay, this would be P anyhow. Okay, so what, what I'm saying is that the maximal operator is bounded on LP of omega if and only if omega is in AP. So if we make this class bigger, this is not going to happen anymore. But this happens with many other operators. For example, the Hilbert transfer is bounded on LP if and only if omega is in AP. So the point here is that if we make this class bigger, then we don't have examples of operators. So what, uh, the way that we solve this, uh, this problem in a joint war with uh, Lucas Grafakos and Javier Soria was take a bigger family, but in order to have examples of operator, we need to change the condition that in, instead of being a strong type, it has to be restricted, uh, restricted weak type, okay? So we all know that LP01, is contained in LP0 and is contained in LP0 infinity. Okay, so therefore this condition here is weaker than to be uh, strong. And since it is weaker, we can allow to have a bigger class. Okay, so we prove that that condition, as soon as I define the class, uh, is going to imply restrictive weak type at least for characteristic sets, okay? So somehow this is a theorem that uh, solved the problem uh, that uh, the Rubio de Francia extrapolation theorem had that it cannot go down, okay? So what we found, found out is that there is a way of uh, going down, okay? So I have to explain you uh, what is this class and, and so. Uh, what I, ah, okay, so this is just nothing. Um, um, for for um, simplicity in the notation, I am going to write that condition exactly in this way, okay? So this, this is not an space, it's just a way of writing down the restrictive with type, uh, with type one one. Okay, so uh, as a corollary of that result, of course, we have that uh, this condition that we are assuming is stronger than LP, right? Because if it, we have with type by rubric de Francia, we can go up and uh, it can be the, from, from, from there, it is uh, clear that the condition that we are assuming is stronger as it has to be than, than the condition of Rubio de Francia. So the problem is, uh, do we have examples of that? What is this class? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we find out what was the right class, but after that, uh, we realized that this class was already known because the class that we needed, it turns out to be the class, the natural class. Okay, after all, it was the natural class. We see the, the class that completely characterized the restrictive weak type for the, uh, for the hard deleted loop maximum operator. And this was done in 82 by Kerman and Torchiski, and they, they just uh, give the definition of what that class should be. There is also an, another paper of the same year of Chung, Hanty, Kurth, that they also did it in a different way. Okay, so both of them characterizes completely the restrictive with type uh, boundedness of the hard deletable maximum operator. Now, as I said, this condition is stronger. So if we want that our theory makes any sense, we need examples. And uh, well, here are examples, of course, the hard little boot was the clear, and then it is easy to prove that every calderon simon operator satisfies that condition or the intrinsic square function or G functions or the Iadi Harsif or sparse operator. If you are familiar with this kind of operator, all of them um, uh, 
uh, we can we can check that satisfy our hypothesis. We did not succeed it with the Borne Ries operator uh, or RAF operator. This was at the, in our paper we, we didn't we didn't know if this was uh, if the Borne Ries operator, which is uh, bounded. Of course, this operator is bounded from LP into LP for every P in AP. But uh, this proof was based in some very nice properties of the class AP that does not have the class uh, APR, let's say, okay? And, and then we, we didn't succeed in improving if for the Bonner risk operator, our hypothesis uh, was true. Okay, so the theorem that uh, is the main uh, topic of this uh, talk is that, um, that the, that the condition that we impose is uh, equivalent to the restricted um, uh, to the restricted um, estimate for weak type one one. This is the result that uh, we have got with my student uh, Sergi Sergi Vaina. So this was the result. Uh, this was the result that we had uh, with the uh, Grafacos and, and Soria, and uh, now what we have proof is that uh, they both are equivalent. And the main point here is that this space is a Banach space. So the technique that I explained you before, the first try, let's say, the technique that says that, um, that we can go up and then apply Minkowski interline inequality and then go down is going to work uh, very well with this, with this new class of spaces. And so, for example, it's a first application. We finally can prove uh, that the, yes, the Borner risk operator at the critical index satisfy our our hypothesis. Okay, I'm going to give you. Okay, this is just um, the the idea of the, of the proof. And uh, well, to that uh, I need some. I'm going to write down in, in, in this here some some notation that I need. So this is the this is the well the idea of the proof. So we want uh, well, this this g here. This g is going to be t of f. Okay, just for for simplicity, and we have to measure uh, y, and then this is the, the the distribution function. We have to measure with the with the weight v the measure of where g is uh, bigger than one. And uh, remember that the hypothesis that we have is that uh, our operator is of, of weight type 1, 1, okay? Uh, for every weight in A1. And here, our weight V, so our weight V is in our class APR, okay? Now, you know that when a weight is in AP, there is a very famous uh, and important result and, and useful as a result, which is the fa factorization theorem. So uh, V is in AP, if and only if it can be written as a weight in A1 and then another weight in A1 to the power one minus P. And also there is also some result that uh, where can I write that? I'm going to write down here. A weight is in A1 if and only if uh, U is of the form essentially uh, the maximal function of a locally integrable function. And then we have here delta, one, uh, sorry, just delta. Okay, delta. And then uh, this delta has to be strictly less than one. Okay, so it turns out that what we what we saw is that uh, this v here this v here can be written as a weight in a one times something to the power one minus p. So what we are saying is that our class is just the endpoint of this class. So for the AP class, delta has to be less than one, and in our operator, delta can be one. Okay. So this is the this is the cl class that we are dealing with. Okay? So what we are going to do here is what, that we are going to leave one minus theta out and we are going to put u to the theta for some theta. And then we are going to leave this here. And this is what we have called here this b theta. Okay, so this, this that, that I have here is b theta. So what are, what are we doing in this, in, in this uh, inequality? 
in this inequality, what we are doing is just we are we are um, how to say let okay so we take u to the one minus theta and then this u to the theta times m h we put inside of a, a function which is defined in the following way so m h is a, a m mu sorry m mu of a function h is nothing but m h to the one over mu times two mu. Okay, so this is essentially a maximal operator to a power mu times a weight in a one to the power one minus theta. And these uh, parameters theta and mu are chosen in such a way that this is a weight in a one. So this is the main point, okay? So, so we are trying to see how to apply the hypothesis. So we majorize by something that uh, we construct some weight in a one, okay? And finally, uh, this uh, set here is nothing, sorry, this set here is nothing but this one. Okay, this is just uh, to write down in, in the transparent. Okay, so we are, we are now can apply the hypothesis. Forget about this, because this is not going to be important for, for our purposes. These are the constant. It, they are important for, and for some other purpose, but not for the purpose of this talk. So we apply the hypothesis, and then we have that this condition here is less than or equal uh, the integral of the function f against that that's the weight that we have constructed. And now the second thing is just an equality. We just write down this in a different way. And the last inequality is just duality. Okay, so if we succeeded in uh, estimate this quantity in the in the right way, then we we, we can finish the, the proof. Okay, so let me just say that this this technique is the classical technique. Okay, so so this idea of constructing a way uh, in order to apply the hypothesis and then apply duality is the standard technique in Rubio de Francia extrapolation uh, theory, okay? But now we have to manage of how to uh, control this quantity here. And this is the lemma that we did. So this is the lemma that I'm not going to, I'm not going to give you the proof because this is the technical part of the, of the proof. Um, it has not been uh, very, very, very much difficult, let me say, okay? Uh, but it, it, well, it was the, this, this was open for some years. <laughs> this, um, um, so it was, not, it was not so easy initially, okay? Now, let me tell you the idea of how to solve uh, that and where the difficult, to, difficult were, okay? So the point is that if, the difficulty is here. The difficulty is because we are dealing with weak type spaces, right? Because if we just take a, a weight in AP and instead of weak type, we put here LP prime, then the, the proof is very easy, okay? And, and the point is that because in LP prime, we can pass that way to, the, to here. Okay, and then we, the idea is that, is that uh, to take theta and mu in such a way that that uh, combination is in the right AP prime mu class. And everything is just uh, uh, straightforward. Okay, so, uh, well, if you, if you haven't followed the proof, don't worry, but because the only thing that I wanted to tell you is that uh, this is a very easy proof in the strong, case okay but uh, in the weak type case this is false the, the, this is false we cannot pass that function to here and that makes things much more complicated okay so in any case we got the result and therefore in the, the corollary tell us that uh, the question that i address at the beginning of the talk is true Okay, so if we have a family of operators which has weak type one one for every u in a one uniformly, then the average operator is restricted weak type uh, for every u in a one. Okay, 
So now, well, in particular, this was the this was the motivation. Okay, in the introduction, uh, I just took this example because I thought that it was going to be much easier to understand. But this is just a particular case of a probability measure space. Okay, a probability measure case. Okay, now the point is uh, we, we would like to go from uh, weaker one to the whole space. Okay, so we don't want to have only restricted weak type, but we want to have a boundedness on the whole space. And this in general, this is, is false. Okay, so we, there are examples of operator satisfying that condition for which this is false. So in general, this is not true. But in 2004, I saw this question uh, for the case uh, U equals one. So in that paper, I solved the question for U equals one. Uh, and with uh, in that paper with uh, Lucas Grafacos and Javier Soria, we 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 did it for every uh, u in a one, and uh, the the point is that uh, we had to define the, what we call I call epsilon delta atomic operator. So let me tell you what it is an epsilon delta atomic operator. So first of all, what it is an atom. So we have delta, a function a is called a delta atom if satisfying the following conditions. So well, if you have work, uh, have ever worked with atoms, you know that atoms has to have cancellation and has to have uh, well, support, okay? Uh, sometimes size, okay? But for me, a delta atom is going to be a, a function which is support in a cube of a measure uh, less than or equal than delta and that it has cancellation. And then a, an operator is said to be epsilon delta atomic if for every epsilon there exists a delta in such a way that we compute the norm on an atom in a big space, as it can be L1 plus L infinity, this can be controlled by epsilon time the L1 norm of, of the atom. Okay, so it might seem it might seem a very well uh, not complicated. This is not complicated, but uh, well, a strange uh, definition. But it turns out that there are many, many, many operators which satisfy that condition. Well, in fact, I don't need to be a silon delta atomic. It is enough that it can be approximated by a silon delta atomic. And the, uh, and the point is that, for example, this is just an example, there are many others. And in a maximal operator of operator which are defined by kernels satisfying that they are, let's say, translation invariant in some sense, okay? When, no, no, continuous, continuous, sorry, in the norm, then they are epsilon delta atomic approximable, okay? So, so, so there are many. It's, it's easier to construct a, an epsilon delta atomic operator than, than, than operator which are not epsilon delta atomic. Okay, so the result, it says that uh, the result that we got is that if we have uh, epsilon delta atomic uh, proximal operators uh, satisfying the condition that it is uh, restricted with type, then uh, we have the complete uh, with type boundedness. Well, the constant, uh, unfortunately, the constant is not so good for other purposes, but it, for this talk is not so important. Okay, so now I can tell you the application. And um, well, so we have here the first application, as I told you, we can have operator, which are, I think that uh, this is a, well, this is just for f of y. This is just uh, f of y or f of y. Okay, so, so we have applications, uh, calderon simon operator or, or something of that kind. And then uh, if that operator is with tie one one, then when we make a modification, a nice modification, then we also have that it is one one. This is one the application that I have given to you. Or for example, the result that I did with my former student, Carlos Domingo Salazar, that under that condition, size condition, then the, those operators which are defined in this way satisfy that it is with type one one. And uh, here we also have uh, some application to restriction of Fourier multiplier from dimension n plus k to dimension n. Okay, and this is um, well, this is also in the setting of uh, the Liu theorem. Okay, so the, the the motivation problem that I have given to you was just a restriction to the integers. 
but uh, we can also think, for example, that we have a multiplier uh, in defined in R2. And we want to, to see what happens if we just restrict uh, the, we just fix one variable and we consider the other variable um, in just one in, in just one dimension, for example. Okay. So in 2012, we got that result with my student Salvador Rodriguez Lopez that says that if we have a regulated function, the, in that paper, I have mentioned that paper before. So we have a multiplier which is defined in R m plus k, and we know that it is uh, restricted with type for every u in a one. Then when we fix one variable, the multiplier remains the boundedness in, in L1 of, with type one one for every b in a one. And moreover, they are uniformly bounded. Okay, so this was a theorem that we proved. And now uh, as a consequence, every time that we have a multiplier in, in our n plus k dimension, we can define just by integration with a nice function phi in L1, and we also have that those operators are uh, bounded, uh, bounded with type one one in, in a weaker, for a, sorry, weaker, no, lower dimension. Okay, so let me see. I don't know what time is it. Uh, Okay, so let me tell you that uh, I don't know if I'm going to have enough time to, uh, how many minutes do I have, uh, Rames? You have some 10 minutes. Ah, okay, so 10 minutes, I can tell you something, yes. Okay, because uh, what I have told you is just the main body, let's say, of what I wanted to tell you, but uh, the theory, this theory, uh, well, can be uh, continued in, in, in many different settings or contexts, and um, for example, le let me give you three of them. Uh, so the first one is what is called limited extrapolation. The limited extrapolation is when the operator that we have is just bounded, uh, it is bounded not for every, uh, not for every weight in AP, but for a subclass, because this weight, if we take alpha less than one, these weights are in AP, but they are not all. So sometimes we may have boundedness of the operator, but not for the whole class AP, okay? And then this is called uh, limited extrapolation. And uh, this was uh, done initially for, by Grafakos and Martel. And uh, essentially the conclusion is that, uh, well, uh, we can just have boundedness uh, from LP in LP, let's say, but for every p uh, for some, in an interval, we cannot extrapolate to the whole p, but we have some boundedness on, on some interval. And, um, and this theorem is very useful, for example, for Bernier Ries operator when the exponent lambda is under the critical index. Okay, but I'm not going, this is just some, some things that we could do. Uh, the second thing, the second path could be just extending the theory to multilinear settings. So for, for multilinear operator, I did this with my student, Edward Roura. And then the, the last uh, path, which uh, uh, we have done with my student, Sergi Baena, is to see what kind of boundedness we can have uh, in the setting of rearrangement in variant spaces, okay? For this talk, I have to choose one of those and I have choose this one, the, 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 this one, okay? So I'm going to tell you in the, in the minutes that I have, what can we say in the setting of multilinear operator? So first of all, I want to motivate the problem. And the problem is, uh, the motivation is that we can define what it is a bilinear Fourier multiplier in the following way. So a function in two variables is called a Fourier, a bilinear Fourier multiplier if that operator here, so we take the function f, we take a function f, we compute the Fourier transform, we take the function g, we compute the Fourier transform, and then we multiply by that function in two variables and we make the inverse Fourier transform. So if that operator is bounded from LP0 uh, cross, L, uh, sorry, LP1 cross LP2 into LP, then we say that this is a Fourier multiplier and this is a usual, the standard uh, relation, okay? So imagine, for example, I, I, I am going to motivate with this problem that I like very much, 
imagine that we have a finite measure and we define a function in this way. So this is like in one variable was the case of the bounded variation function. And we want to know when this operator satisfies, for example, that it is with tie one one, and then we have to put here one half. Okay, so we want to study that kind of problem. Okay, so first of all, uh, Grafakos and Martel in 2004, they developed an extrapolation theory of Rubio de Francia for multilinear operators. So in particular, they proved that uh, if you have an operator that satisfies that condition here, okay, so we, this has to happen for every V in AP, for every omega in AP zero, the function U has to be of this form and so on, uh, then, it can be extrapolated to every Q1, Q2, and Q with that relation and every V in a Q and every omega in a Q2. Okay, so this is the, the natural standard Rubio de France extrapolation theory and the result is true. But in the same way that it happens in the linear case, we cannot arrive to the end point. Okay, so we can extrapolate at every point, but we cannot arrive to the end point. So, the question that I gave to my student, Edouard, was the following. Imagine that instead of having a strong type, I mean, it was a very natural question, I, I say. So instead of having a strong type, we have restricted weak type, but for this bigger class of weight. Can we end it up in the, at the end point? Can we arrive at the end point? Okay. So in that setting, the, the answer is going to be, well, we have to work out, okay? So the first theorem that we got, which is, uh, was, uh, I mean, what is expected, is that if we are in the diagonal, so look that here is P, P, and P half. So we are in the diagonal, the result is true. And this, and this as I said, was very easy. In fact, it was the motivation that I gave him this, this problem, right? Okay, so. If we have that information here, so if we know the boundary is here and we are in the diagonal, then we can go through that uh, through that line up to one one. Now the second theorem that we got is that well the diagonal wall was not necessary, we could go through any ray. So if we have the boundary is here, we could go up to at up to the boundary. Okay, so that's the, the theory that we go up to the boundary. And uh, well, this was, uh, it take us some time, but at the end with some more effort, we succeeded in proving that if we have the, if we, the we have the boundaries in some P, we can go both horizontally up to the boundary and we can go vertically up to the boundary and, uh, and therefore we got all this thing here, okay? And uh, well, this thing here and this thing here and this thing here, uh, we need the, we, in, in general, we didn't succeed, but we, we solved some partial cases, okay? So this is the theory uh, that we got. So this is a, in particular, uh, in particular, we can arrive to the end point which was our original motivation, okay? So this is the, the result. Now, why this theory has been uh, difficult I, I know that I have to finish in two minutes. Uh, because look, for example, something that it is absolutely trivial in LP, like that the norm in LP of this uh, of the product of two function for that uh, combination of weight, this is Helder, and therefore we do have that. We didn't know if it was true initially, and after a while we found a contraexample. So this kind of inequality, which are just two lines in LP, in weak LP are false, okay? And that uh, makes things that uh, true, uh, sorry, that much more difficult. And, um, and we also need to, to find out what were the right way for the maximal operator, which for the case of a strong was very easy, but for the case of weak tie was not. And uh, finally, uh, Edouard with Carlos Perez uh, have proved that uh, the result is, is I, I'm, I am going to a little fast because uh, I am running out of time, but uh, let me just uh, tell you that this was finally find out. And, and, and then uh, the question that uh, we would like to, so this we, this we have, okay? So this is the result that we have. And now, uh, 
taking into account that in the linear case, these two things are equivalent, we are trying to solve, but we have not tried yet very hard, I have to say. So this is a question if they, they both think are equivalent. Okay. And to finish, uh, let me just say that the question that we want to address, initially, it is still open. And the main reason is not because uh, we have, uh, we already have the, the extrapolation theorem result. But the problem is that when we write down what it is, this multiplier, we ended up in that we need to find out the boundedness of the product of two Hilbert transform. And this question is still open, okay? So if this is true, we would solve the problem for that multiplier, but we are still working on that condition. Okay, and then here I say, if time allows, I was going to tell you something more, but time does not allow. So that's the end of, the, of my talk. Yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Okay. So let me, now I'm going to, uh, I don't know what to do, okay. So, okay, now I see you because uh, if I, yeah. if I, if I don't, if I put uh, that, I don't, I don't see anything. Okay. Should I, should I, um, okay, so questions. Yeah, so the time for questions. Anybody has any questions, comments? don't see anybody coming up with any questions. I'm audible, right? Okay. No. Ramesh? Yes, yes, it's audible. Yeah. I hope you have okay, everyone so, heard. Okay, so uh, maybe I will just uh, stop sharing. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because if not, I, I cannot see you. <laughs> yeah. Okay.